because uh, I'm also extremely well behaved, so don't feel put off when we get to the question and answer bit that you're now not allowed to ask anything. I should be soft and gentle. Just clarify something first of all, though. I'm not in the top ten most powerful men or women. I am a man. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to talk about for 10 or 15 minutes uh, at uh, Kunle's invitation is a really, really boring subject, which is governance. And I'm going to try to make governance not boring so that you pay attention to all the things that you see in the news and you read in the media about governance and you understand, now maybe you already do, understand why it's important. If you already understand why it's important, we can have a lively discussion about it later on when uh, David grills me and gets his own back for the questioning on the board, which he's had to put up with over some years. But remember, I do sit on the group of people who set your pay. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't done it very well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we could do it a lot worse. <laughs> if you listen to all the stuff, if you, if, actually, if you cut out all the noise about the economy and the meltdown and all the rest of it, you take all the adjectives and the hyperbole out, even as a card-carrying optimist as I am, I have to concede there patently is something wrong. So a lot of the things we get told about are not true. They're exaggerated. They're there just to grab headlines. But there is patently something wrong. And when you get down to it, the headlines that we see that we know give us an insight into what's wrong are symptomized in the UK by Fred Goodwin's pension. But Fred Goodwin's pension is just an example of lots and lots of things that have gone wrong in the last few years. And some of those things that have gone wrong in the last few years are rather bigger in quantum than Fred Goodwin's pension. For example, uh, the Madoff scandal, the Ponzi scheme scandal. In fact, in Restoration Partners, we have a unit of money now, which is a Madoff, which is $50 billion. And I have, I have a colleague who says, why are we talking about this? It's not even point one of a Madoff. So Madoff is a probably bigger example, not just in quantum, but in collapse of a system of what's gone wrong than Fred's pension. But so is the complete collapse in the prime mortgage marketplace and banks buying things that they didn't understand. The danger is in this world of celebrity and personality that we focus on Fred Goodwin and his house and we miss the bigger point, which is that something systemic went wrong uh, with the world financial system. What was it? What lessons can we learn about it? And more importantly, how can we be vigilant to make sure it's not reappearing wherever we've got influence? And what went wrong with governance? Travis, governance is really boring. Governance is, is defined in the UK by something called the Combined Code, which is a set of, quote, guidelines on how boards ought to conduct themselves in managing the affairs of companies. And if you look at the Combined Code, which I do from time to time, uses try to win an argument against somebody because I've run out of logic, so I now to do a quote that he can't quickly respond to. But if you look at the Combined Code, it, it's very, very dull. It says things like the chairman and chief executive should be two people and not one person. Now, there was a time in the UK when the chairman and chief executive were generally a person, and still in America it's common. But in the UK, it's not common. It was, it's been changed, because it's a, quote, good governance practice. And you kind of yawn, close that, and turn back to watching Channel 99 on television, because it must be more interesting than reading the combined code. And yet, what's gone wrong in the system, I argue, is governance has failed. So let me do a definition of governance, and let me show you why I think it's failed. And to do that, we've got to understand not the whole of capitalism, but how entrepreneurialism and capital and public markets all come together. So I'm make, let me make up an ex, a story, but it's symptomatic of so many public companies. Some chap lives in a village, lives in a town rather, and he's a baker. And he has a shop and he bakes. So he gets up at whatever time you get up as a baker, 4 o'clock in the morning, you do all the dough, put it in the oven, by 6 o'clock you're ready to sell bread, you say to all the people, it goes well. His wife helps him in the shop, his children run around when they're not at school doing the sweeping up and so on. It's a classic family business, could happen anywhere, it does happen everywhere in, in the world. But this particular baker, let's call him Mr. Bunn, so I can keep your attention on this point, Mr. Bunn the baker does really rather well and buys a second shop out of his savings from the first shop in that same town. Now the problem he's got is how do you manage that second shop? Well, what he does, it's very simple, he promotes somebody who's working from his first shop and he leaves them to run the first shop while he runs the second bakery and shop. And because he lives over the first one, every morning he gets up at now 3.30, has a half an hour briefing with his manager, then goes off to the other bakery, does all his stuff, comes back in the evening, has a wash-up meeting with his manager, and goes to bed to sleep before the next day. That's a classic small business. Entrepreneur runs a business. But he's really good at this. And over time, he manages, through a succession of luck and a little bit of bank borrowing, to get to half a dozen bakeries around the area. 
So he's got to have a manager in each of those, so that model was replicable, scalable. It's a growing business. It's what businesses are about. So now there are six. He doesn't bother doing any of the baking himself anymore. He just spends his time supervising the six people, and that creates profits and builds up an endowment for his family, pays for his children to go to university so they don't want to work in the baker's shop, and he runs the business. So far, so good. Trouble is, he's borrowed from the bank in that process. And he goes to see the bank manager, and the bank manager says, well, actually, you're a great covenant. We've lent you this money. You've done rather well. You pay everything back at the time. We'll lend you some more money. And he says, hmm, if I had a lot more money, what can I do? Well, I could buy shops not just in this town, but in the region. So he borrows some more money from the bank and starts to buy more shops. He owns all of the shares himself in the company, and he's got debt from the bank. So he's a happy chap. He's actually a very happy chap because he's now got 20 or 30 people working for him in different shops, lots of bank debt. He has time off. He now gets time to play golf. So he goes to the golf club, he plays golf, he becomes a pillar of society, gives money to charity, does all the things that capitalism and entrepreneurship are supposed to be about. And somewhere along the line, the bank says, you know, we're a bit worried that we're a bit dependent on you. We've taken out key man insurance on you, but we just want to make sure that if anything, heaven forbid, happened to you, you know, things will, still could keep running because we've got quite a lot of debt outstanding here. Uh, we'd like you to form a proper board of directors. So he says, well, I don't need a board of directors. You know, I've built it so far myself. You know, I've managed this on my own. The bank says, no, we insist. So he forms a board of directors by asking a retired bank manager and a retired accountant who play golf with him to join his board. So they meet every now and again. They have an hour's meeting, go to lunch somewhere, have lots to eat and drink, and then go and play golf in the afternoon. But they are the board of directors of the company. They sign all the forms. They do all the things that you're supposed to do. So far, so good. Nobody worries. The business continues to, to prosper. He values the advice of his two chums, but he used to, when they weren't directors, they were just people he played golf with. But now he's formalized the whole process. And one day, he realizes he's got 100 shops. It's an enormous business. And he thinks... What am I going to do with this wealth that I've created? And also the bank are pressing me to repay the debt. I'll float it. So he takes a private company, a cosy club-managed company, and floats it on the stock exchange. This is the story of every entrepreneur's dream. It's what you try to do when you start your business. You get a good exit. You take it on the stock exchange. He sells some of his shares and puts the money that he makes from that in the bank. He raises enough money to pay off all the bank debt, so it's now a really good investment for people. And, and the shares that he sold to do that go to the general public. The general public is AXA, large insurance company, and, the general, and they have a fund manager, and he's bought £5 million worth of the shares in that because that's the unit he, he deals in. But it's also ladies and gentlemen of the area who knew about this baker's dot and thought it was a local story. Widows, the so-called widows and orphans. Now, AXA can look after themselves. The widows and orphans, of course, haven't got many shares, don't get many votes in this process. This chap, of course, Mr. Bunn, has a real problem now because he's now got people who ask him difficult questions who are not the bank manager. He's asked questions by the shareholders. And they ask reasonable questions like, what are your plans for growth? How are you going to improve your earnings per share? Etc., etc. And he looks around his board, and his board is the two men that were on it from before because they're obviously good old boys and he likes them a lot, and a couple more people he had on who also like him. And one day he decides to expand by making a bid for another, another chain. He makes the bid for the other chain, he buys the chain, it goes disastrously wrong, the company goes bust. Now what went wrong with that story, apart from the fact it's very sad, although he did bank some money when he went public, the sad thing was the money bank belonged to the widows and orphans, and so who was looking out for their interests, actually quite hard to do. That is what's known in economics as the agency problem. Because when he owned the business, he could tell the manager in each shop what to do. If they didn't do it, he would discipline them and fire them. When he went public, the people who now own the business, because he no longer owned the business, didn't have that same capability of access to the operation of the organization. The agency problem, because it is, it is a problem, which needs to be overcome because you need to be able to spread the capital for the model to work, is at the root of our governance problem that has blown up in the last two years. Because what happened with my little story was Mr. Bunn, of course, was an autocrat. That's how he built the business the way he built the business. So he surrounded himself on the board by chums. And, of course, the chums liked him anyway. That's why they came on it. They got a decent lunch every board meeting. They now get a decent fee for being directors. What was in, how was it in their interest to challenge any of the decision, decisions Mr. Bunn made, like, for example, buying that last chain that did for the business? Turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Baker's board directors don't vote for losing a great lunch once a quarter and all those other things. And that governance problem is what the original governance exercise in the UK, which was called the Cadbury Committee, sought to deal with. Because what we've done in the UK, we peopled the boards of our major companies 
let's say the top 100, with about 300 people who sat on each other's boards and looked after each other. And if I sit on your remuneration committee and you sit on my remuneration committee, I'm going to put your pay up because I know you'll put my pay up. And even if I'm a straight person, it's going to be a temptation all the time to do that and impossible for, impossible for me to defend to the widow and orphan that I wasn't doing it, even if I wasn't doing it, because she would say, but hang on, you both sit on each other's boards and your pay has gone up over the years and all I've seen is my dividends cut. This can't be right. So the challenge is how, when you've got a really widespread ownership... Do the owners exercise influence on the company and on its operations? The answer is through the directors, the non-executive directors. And this is true across the world, whether you're in France, which is a different system of governance or principle of governance to ours, the US, which has a very different one of our own. It's the same logic. The agency problem is tackled by having a board of directors. And what went wrong last year in the Fred the Shred and, and, and was the board of directors failed. 